Let's uh, get started with the next subject, which is reinforcement learning. So originally, um, Professor Zoltan Nagy uh, was invited, and uh, he was kindly accepted to be here today and uh, talk to us about uh, uh, reinforcement learning and its application in um, uh, demand response and consumers' behavior modeling and things like that. Uh, the, the group that uh, is uh, directed by Zoltan is pretty, they are very famous and very good in using uh, in, uh, reinforcement learning in multiple applications. Uh, although he planned everything, bought the tickets and so on, he couldn't make it today uh, due to some visa issues. But uh, we are, I'm glad that Jose is here with us. Um, so he's a PhD candidate in the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Architectural Engineering. My, uh, his thesis is on the applications of reinforcement learning for demand response, and he's being uh, supervised by Professor Zoltan Nagy. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think you, you were a part of uh, developing that city learn package as well. Yeah, learn city yeah, I, yeah. I am developing it, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So please join me welcoming uh, Jose. And we'll listen to you. Yeah, thank you, Ali, for the introduction. So, yeah, today I will be talking about the applications of reinforcement learning for demand response, which is my main topic of my PhD thesis. I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of Texas in Austin at the Intelligent Environments Laboratory, led by Professor Sultan Nagy. And, and a little bit about myself, uh, I did my uh, bachelor's and master's in Universidad Pontificia Comillas in Spain in electromechanical engineering and industrial engineering like with focus on, on power systems. Then I did my master's thesis at EPFL focusing more on urban scale uh, energy analysis and control. And then I started my PhD thesis in, in 2016 in the University of Texas in, in Austin. Uh, trying to integrate reinforcement learning with, uh, with the, for demand response applications in, at the district uh, level. Um, so for today, uh, I will start by talking more about the big picture and about demand response. And then I think it's uh, very important, as Professor Spiros uh, said yesterday, to really motivate why we are using some machine learning technique before using it and seeing what are the advantages and if we really need to use it for this application or if it might be an overkill or we might have some, some problems with it. So first I will talk about uh, a bit about demand response, uh, what types we have, uh, what are the main challenges and if we can use RL in order to address uh, these challenges. And then I will focus more on reinforcement learning itself uh, what, it, uh, what it is, what is re the relationship with Markov decision processes, uh, and then some basic uh, reinforcement learning al algorithms such as Q-learning, and then some others that we can use for continuous state action spaces such as batch Q-learning, actor critic methods, and then also what type of uh, open AI environments we can use in order to test different uh, reinforcement learning controllers. And then on the second day tomorrow, that we will have three hours almost, I will do a little bit of a recap of what we did today. And then I will focus a bit more on the implementation itself, like what, how we can implement reinforcement learning, what are some state-of-the-art agents that we can implement. Then I will talk about CityLearn, which is a, a package that I've been developing for the man re to, to easily integrate reinforcement learning for demand response at the district level and how we can use it with our own reinforcement learning agents or with reinforcement learning agents that have already been developed and that we can just plug and play and, and try them out. And then we'll do some practice of coding some reinforcement learning and on CityLearn and seeing how we can use it in order to provide demand response services at the distribution level. So first, a little bit of the big picture. So buildings account for about 40% of the global energy use and then about 30% of the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in the US alone, they consume about 70% of the, of the total electricity consumption. So by, by being able to, to provide some flexibility on the electricity that buildings consume, 
then we will be able to, to tackle problems such as the large amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we have and also trying to reduce the amount of, of energy that we consume. So in demand response, we are trying to do several things, but some of the important ones is that it allows us to align the peaks of electricity consumption with the peaks of ele uh, um, electricity generation from renewable sources, and then we can also reduce the, the peak demand uh, of the consumers. And then and this can have a great impact, not only in the capital investments that we need to make in the electrical grid, but also in the electricity generation side. Typically, when there are very high peaks of electricity generation, we'll have picking plants that we'll have to generate, and some of them are typically consuming natural gas, which is more expensive, it has a more expensive variable cost. So this increases the price of electricity and also creates more greenhouse gas emissions. So peak shaving will be important and also trying to align the peaks of electricity consumption with the peaks of, of renewable energy generation. And there are different ways in which we can try, or philosophies in which uh, we can try to address a demand response. So there are different types of demand response uh, programs. Uh, the two big ones will be incentive-based programs and then time-based rate programs. So in the incentive-based programs, we are trying to make consumers participate in exchange for some economic uh, reward. And then when we need to do some load curtailment and shave the peaks, the peaks of electricity or shift it, then we will force the consumers to do it. Uh, and there's a legal contract and, and they need to do it. So this is a bit of a, an invasive method. And then the other one, the time-based rate, uh, rate programs, is a little bit more about uh, providing the right price signals to try consumers to modify their energy consumption habits and try to change the curve of the electricity consumption by providing them with different prices or rates at different times that they will know in advance. And then by knowing these prices, they can adapt their behavior and maybe try to use certain appliances or loads at different times when electricity will be cheaper. And then the overall, like just trying to flatten the overall curve of electricity consumption. Yeah, so first I want to, to ask some questions to the audience on what do you think that the main problems or challenges might be for the implementation of successful demand response programs for consumers. Which one? Privacy. Privacy one? Mm -hmm. Because of sharing? I mean, if, it depends how you address it, but yeah, like because they will need to, to provide a lot of data of their energy consumption, right? And look, with smart meter data, for example. If you go for real-time pricing, probably you don't have the privacy issue at least. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but the other thing is, I mean, the, the biggest problem is, how, or the, the way that I see, the biggest problem is you can't make a compelling business case for demand response. Firstly, because uh, there is no ac accurate model of demand behavior in response to incentives or anything else. Mm -hmm. So the lack of this model you know, doesn't allow us to, you know, to see what is the real potential of demand. Yeah, or that maybe you provide, yeah, that maybe you provide some incentives, but you don't know what people would have done otherwise, right? Yes. If you had not, never provided them. Yeah. 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 So the company I work for, we're actually. Uh, doing a demand uh, residential demand management program uh, over this summer mm -hmm. and the biggest problem we have is not necessarily with the baseline methodology and to work out what a customer would have done if we hadn't called an event it was what's the best incentive scheme because mm -hmm. we haven't quite worked out that balance out yet I mean how much do you need to incentivize a customer in order for them to participate or not mm -hmm. if you've got a, a day where it's 41 42 degree day and we're telling them try and reduce your energy consumption, be it turn down your air conditioner or, or whatever, and we say we'll pay you 10 Australian dollars, to some customers they'll say, I don't want that, that's not enough, I'm gonna just leave my air conditioner on anyway. So it's like, at what point do you mm -hmm. uh, try to work out what the best incentive is for all customers, knowing that not all customers are the same? Mm -hmm. You know, some are gonna be more energy conscious than others, some are in it just for the money, some mm -hmm. are in it to try to le legitimately help out with um, the grid, so yeah. yeah. Like, that's just what we've noticed. We've got another month and a half to go on the program, and we've already seen these kind of behaviours happening. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. If I just say that... 
could be that the, um, there's asymmetry between the customer and how they value energy and the grid and how they value energy. For a customer to have the mental energy of actually turning their appliances off, they need to be really quite heavily compensated and it may not be worth the grid to compensate them that much. Yeah, so I think for <clears throat> what you are saying, we can agree that uh, the main problem is that electricity has a high value in relationship uh, to its price, right? So for most consumers, it's just not worth uh, the hassle of trying to sh curtail their energy load uh, just for this. This happens both at the residential and the, at the commercial level. Like if you have an office building, then your main cost is probably the salary of your employees, and not really the cost of energy. So you want them to be as productive and comfortable as you want. If you're a retailer, you want people to be comfortable so they buy more. And even residential consumers, most of the time, uh, yeah, they just don't want to be hot in summer. Um, yeah, and then even if they want to be like environmentally conscious and try to consume more renewable energy, and they are willing to, to participate actively in demand response programs. There's another problem which we were talking about, which is the decision fatigue problem. Like they might participate in these programs for a few weeks, but then over time they, they just don't want to know what the prices will be the next day. So they can modify their behavior according to that or anything like that, just to, fi to save like 10 or 15 bucks in the, in the energy bill. Uh, so these are two main pro uh, problems here. So in order to solve them, um, I think we can uh, come to the conclusion that a successful demand response program uh, must provide these cost savings, but in an automated way and without causing any kind of discomfort or dissatisfaction for the, for the users that are going to be participating in the, this kind of program. So I think this is very important. And this is where some automated and adaptable algorithm might might have an opportunity of, of being successfully implemented. And this is part of the motivation for, for reinforcement learning. So then we have different types of, of energy loads. So we have some that are very flexible. This can be domestic hot water if they have storage and they are electrical, like electric heaters or heat pumps. Then we have batteries and electric vehicles that we will see that they will probably become increasingly popular in the future increasing the amount of energy that we can store or release at different times in a distributed way. Then we also can store some energy in the building uh, thermal mass, but only to some extent, because for that we need to modify the temperature set points in the building that, ca that can have an impact in comfort. But yeah, we can, we can indeed do some pre-cooling or pre-heating of the, of the building at different times and try to maintain the, the temperature set points at a reasonable level. So we can play a little bit uh, here, although more at the, at the commercial level. And then we also have chillers in commercial buildings that they can have, for example, ice storage. So we can also store some energy for, for cooling, especially in, in large uh, buildings. And then we have uh, some other types of appliances, such as dryer, laundry machines, and dishwashers more at the residential uh, level, that they can be a bit flexible. For the users, it might not be much of a problem to set the schedule the dryer or these devices at different times, but they are less flexible than these others, of course. And then the less flexible ones that people don't really want to, yeah, to modify their consumption habits will be these ones, basically, and probably many others. But So the conclusion is that we, can, we cannot really automate all of these uh, devices easily without causing some sort of discomfort, or at least definitely not the less flexible ones. So what we think is that it's worth focusing more on buildings that have a lot of uh, flexible devices that we can actually use for load curtailment and demand response. Uh, sorry, Jose, uh, just f you said the fridge is under less flexible um, I, I know that, for instance, in 2006 and seven, in, in uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab in the U.S., they uh -huh. designed um, uh, small modulation devices which could be installed on a fridge, uh -huh. and then during the frequency drop, uh, it could, you know, modulate 
the, uh, yes, and uh, it was quite successful. And at some some point, they wanted to you know uh, uh, deploy it as a normal thing in all fridge and even dryer and other type of uh -huh. devices. But I'm not sure you know how big of flexibility they are. But yeah, they can provide some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, hopefully, we can move some of these devices to the more flexible group with a lot more flexibility. But yeah, this is certainly like an, an interesting topic. And then what we are trying to do here is to control, focus on the control of these devices in our research. So if we have a district with multiple buildings, uh, some of them might have distributed energy generation, such as solar panels, and many of them might have uh, these kind of devices that can provide some flexibility, then we want to coordinate them in order to to minimize, for example, uh, the, peak uh, the peak load, the peak to valid ratio, maximize the load factor, uh, basically trying to smoothen and make the electricity demand flatter. So this might be relatively easy if we don't have many uh, flexible devices because uh, the, the shape of our load curve will be more or less the same. And then it's very straightforward where, should, where we should shift uh, the flexible loads to. But if, for example, we start having a lot of uh, batteries or electric vehicles and the flexible load becomes really large, then we have a problem of competition. Like they, all the agents or buildings will try to profit from the lower prices in, in the valley times. And then the peak load might be shifted rather than shaved. So if all buildings are trying to do the same thing, all the agents or the, or the aggregators, and trying to consume more energy when it's expected to be cheaper, then they'll do the same thing and they just create a new peak where it was not supposed to be. Also, if we provide the agents with day ahead prices, then they will all uh, want to do the same thing. And then the actual price, the mismatch between the day ahead price and the actual price will change a lot because the prediction will influence the actions. So this is something that we need to coordinate. In, in either a competitive way or a, co uh, or a coordinated way, like cooperatively, maybe sharing information about the buildings. So there are uh, different types of controllers that we can use. Uh, these are some basic ones. Uh, the most basic one would be the rule-based controller, which is relatively straightforward. It's basically like a table or a schedule. The inputs are the times of the day, the day of the week. It might be also outdoor temperature. And then depending on these input actions, we just uh, have uh, these input variables, we will have some output actions that we will take. So the main advantages are that it's inexpensive to implement and that if something fails, we can easily know where it failed and why and how to fix it, if it's fixable. And then the problem is that it's, yeah, it will underperform other controllers, especially in very complex situations, and it's not really adaptive. Uh, you really need to redesign it for new situations. And then model predictive controller, uh, we just build a model of the system that we want to control, and then we just run an optimization algorithm uh, for a, a time horizon and try to find the set of actions that will ma maximize uh, a given objective function in that horizon. So this type of controller is more expensive because we need to develop a model for every system that we are controlling then it's not, not, not really adaptive. If anything in, in, the model change, in the system changes, then we need to redesign our model, making it costly. And then if something fails, the good thing is that we can know why. Relatively easy, we can look at the model and see why it's not performing properly. And then it has a good performance if it's well designed and, and the system doesn't change in relation to the model. And then we have reinforcement learning, which has a little bit of both. It's on one side inexpensive, in the sense that it, it has the potential to be inexpensive because we can implement it in a plug and play manner. So we can implement it and then we can take historical data and train it. And then it can learn through interaction with the, with the system itself. So another advantage is that it's adaptable. If the dynamics change, because maybe the consumer buys an electric vehicle or you have solar, more solar PV in that district, or anything in the buildings or, or the district changes, it will, it will adapt. So these are the main advantages that reinforcement learning offers that, that we, can, we can use to motivate its use in these situations. The plug and play capabilities, the increasing availability of data from smart meters or any other types, and then the increasing amount of storage that 
that might start to happen with the integration of electric vehicles in the future. And then it's an algorithm that is currently being developed. A new a modern reinforcement learning agents that are improved are coming every year. So as of today, it's still a relatively new field. Um, and then, so the reliability of some of the algorithms is not perfect. Like you might run reinforcement learning for the same problem multiple times. And then you might have different results in some occasions because they use neural, artificial neural networks. But, but as, again, it's a, it's a field that there's still more research going on and every year new algorithms come out. So hopefully in a few years we can have a very stable algorithm that we can actually think of deploying in the, for real world applications such as this one. Uh, just yeah. a simple question. Mm -hmm. So you say uh, increasing availability data, um, most of the data that we are collecting are 15 or 30 minutes or maybe one hour. Is that good enough for reinforcement learning in general? It, well, it depends what you want to use it for. If it's mm. for, for example, you can do like one hour resolution and then just trying to shift the overall peak of demand. But if you want to do more like, yeah, like other, like finer things, like maybe, you know, maybe you want to adapt to to the lack of solar generation when a cloud, like a cloud comes in, mm -hmm. then you will need a min minute resolution, right? So for some things, one, yeah, one hour resolution might be fine. For some others, you might need minute resolution, depending what you want to, to adapt to. Um, just some more questions on the application. So you've, you've gone through um, mm -hmm. a handful of different um, approaches, rule-based, model mm -hmm. predictive, and reinforced. Is, is the application, um, are you trying to understand how DER works in sort of a operational time frame? Is that is that what the application is? Operational time frame? As in like um, to see what it might like look real like time? in real time yeah. or even tomorrow. Is that is that is that the sort of sort of feedback that you It's more to? like in real time, yeah. Okay, sure. But w would such an application work to to try to model um DER oh sorry um um, uh, demand response in say 20 years time? Yeah, I mean, you can simulate that. Okay, it, sure. Yeah, like you can r develop models of these buildings and then simulate them for future climates and for more integration of uh, renewable energies or different things. And in, you can test your reinforcement learning agents on that simulated environment and see how they perform. The, the, only, the only thing with the reinforcement learning is mm -hmm. that you're gathering data from today and mm -hmm. but relative to how, how that data is coming in the the forecast horizon is quite far into the future you mean that it might not be able to adapt to yeah. situations in the future that yeah. it hasn't seen data from yeah. or uh, yeah i mean it all def it all depends how you define your state uh, state variables and and all of that and what changes like if it, it's going to adapt to weather conditions, then it doesn't matter if, you know, in the next years, like the weather will be hotter overall because the daily variations in weather are much bigger than the monthly variations over the years in the future. Uh, if you got, say, 10 um, gigawatts worth of electric vehicles mm -hmm. um, in the future, but you've only got 10 megawatts today, that's, that's a fundamental change in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you need to define things properly. Like if, for example, if you are going to have many different controllers, if a new building suddenly has more electric vehicles, then you might need, you might want to use data from buildings that already have vehicles to train that algorithm, if that makes sense. And then, yeah, so here there are different ways of defining the agents and, and the prices, for example. So the single agent approaches, uh, they have like non-competing objectives. So for example, if we want to coordinate many different energy consuming agents among each other, then a single agent approach would be developing a centralized agent that takes actions on all these uh, buildings. And we can also use a multi-agent approach that can be cooperative or competitive. <clears throat> so in the multi-agent approaches, we have a reinforcement learning agent per building or an energy consuming agent taking actions for that specific agent, and then they might share information among each other on what they are going to do. And they, for example, they could take action sequentially. 
Like one, one building can decide what it's going to do, tell the other buildings, and then they can use this information to act accordingly. So there are different ways of coordinating this, and this is what I, I want to highlight here. And then regarding of this field of research, uh, in the last seven years or so, uh, there have been many publications, especially in the integration of reinforcement learning for electric vehicles, uh, heating, cooling, and ventilation systems in buildings, and also for uh, storage devices, such as uh, batteries and, uh, and distributed uh, generation. So now, yeah, I will focus a bit more on, on reinforcement learning itself and what it's like and how, uh, how it, we can compare it with other machine learning algorithms. So the main machine learning uh, algorithm categories are one of them is supervised learning. In this category, we will have, for example, classification or regression. So we have uh, an input, some features, and then we'll have the output, which is whatever we want to predict using these features. So then we will compare our predictions with the real data, with the labels. We will make the error and, and we will try to update our model in, in order to minimize this error between the predictions and the actual data. Then we have unsupervised learning in which we only have the inputs. And we want to extract patterns or information from these inputs and get it as outputs. So here we have, for example, clustering. So we have a lot of data and yeah, we want to make packages with it. And we can also have anomaly detection, feature extraction, or dimensionality reduction. And then we have the other category, which is uh, reinforcement learning, which is uh, not really either, neither supervised learning nor uh, unsupervised. But here we will have some inputs or states that we need to define. And then we have some performance evaluation metric that we also need to define and that we will call the reward function. So the objective of the reinforcement learning agent is to maximize the accumulated sum of the rewards over a time horizon. And then the outputs of the reinforcement learning agent will be the actions. So the objective is under some given inputs what actions we should take in order to maximize this long-term reward. Yeah. So the, so the outputs will be the actions. So you, yeah, so you will take an action and then according to that action you will receive a reward. Right. So what I mean is that there shouldn't be a feedback from output to performance evaluation and then you have some, some kind of function there? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I will yeah, explain now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's like this. So we have the agent that is the, the, control, the control system and then we have the environment that is whatever we are trying to control. So the, the agent is the control itself, and then the environment is whatever we're trying to control. So if we want to implement reinforcement learning in controlling a building, then the environment will be the building and anything, for example, that has an impact on the reward. Let's say we want to minimize the cost of the energy. So then the environment will be any variable that will have an impact on the cost of that electricity. And this environment will have to follow a mark of decision process in order for reinforcement learning to, to be able to learn. So the agent they will take a control action, and then here's the feedback, uh, I think that we were discussing, that yeah, the environment will return the next state of the system, and then the reward. And then the objective of the agent is to take the right actions over time to maximize all the rewards that it will, it will obtain. So as I mentioned, it's important to select the features or the states of the system such that they follow the Markovian property and that this is a Markov decision process. So what, it mean, what this means is that the, the probabilities of transition into another state only depend on the current state and the action that you will take. And they don't depend on the previous states. So this is the, yeah, the main concept of the Markovian property. So we have a, let's say that we want to implement reinforcement learning in order to control the maintenance pro, uh, process of a machine. So we'll have three different states. That is that the machine is, is just doing good. Then another that is deteriorating and then another one where the machine is uh, broken. So these will be the states. Then the actions that we can take will be uh, doing some maintenance or not doing anything, right? 
and then we want to define the reward. So these different actions in different states will have an associated uh, reward or cost. So in general, uh, not doing anything doesn't have any cost. Uh, unless the machine is broken, then the machine cannot produce whatever is manufacturing, and then you will have a cost, let's say min minus two. Then if you want to do some maintenance, you will have a cost. So you need to include a negative reward for the maintenance, let's say minus one. And then if the machine is broken, let's say that you need, I mean, you will need to repair it. Uh, so then you will have a big cost, let's say minus 10. So then you have, uh, you have all the transition probabilities among the different states depending on what action you take. So every set of states uh, and actions, they will have a transition probability. If, if the machine is doing great and you don't do anything, there's a small chance that it will start to deteriorate. And if you choose to maintain it, then there's a very high chance that it will continue to do, to do well. So what I want to highlight here is that in all these you can move among all these different states with different probabilities depending on the actions that you take. And depending on the actions that you take and where you move to, you will get a different uh, reward. So the objective of uh, reinforcement learning is learning a, a policy. So the definition of policy here is a function that you input to the function the states you are in and it will output what the optimal action is or well it will, it will output what, what option what the actions will be and the optimal policy is that one that will output the optimal actions and it's the kind of policy that we want to learn in the long term so for the reinforcement learning uh, agent the transition probabilities that we see here are unknown and also the reward function is unknown. The reinforcement learning agent doesn't have a model of the system, so it doesn't know what these transition probabilities that I was showing here are or what the reward function will be. It's just observing a state, uh, the new states and the rewards that is seen when it's, it takes different actions. So it will learn through interaction with the environment. And the objective is to learn this policy. And then we have the, I want to introduce the concept of the value function. So every policy that we can follow will have a different value. And reinforcement learning wants to find the optimal policy, which is the policy that has the highest uh, value. So this value function is basically the cumulated sum of all the discounted rewards if we are in a given state and follow a given policy. And then this discount factor that we have here can be any number from zero uh, to one. So the discount factor is probably the most important parameter in reinforcement learning. If we use a discount factor of zero, it means that the reinforcement learning agent is just focusing on maximizing the immediate next reward that it will obtain. And if we have a discount factor that is close to one, this is more of a planning problem. Then reinforcement learning will try to maximize all the sum of all the rewards in the very long term. So typically for most applications, we will want a discount factor that is very close to one. It can be 0 0.99, or, yeah, the, but that depends a lot on the, on the application. And then, yeah, so this value function is important to remember that only depends on the state, because then there's another value function that will also depend on the action that I will introduce. So yeah, the environment will just take a given, yeah, will just take a, sorry, the agent will take an action and then receive the next states and the next reward. And then it will input this, this new state into the policy. It will select the new action. It will take it. And then it will receive the new reward. And then it will use all these rewards and states to learn this value function by making all these updates in this equation and iterating constantly. And then it will find what's the value of every policy that is following. And will just try to explore and find what the, what the optimal policy is or the policy that has the highest value. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the transition probabilities and, and rewards are always unknown. And then we have different types of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. So the main two categories are uh, model-based and model-free. So not all reinforcement learning is model-free. We can actually develop a model, train our reinforcement learning agent with it, and then implement it in the actual system. But this is not really the the type of reinforcement learning algorithm we want to focus on. Because as we mentioned earlier, the main advantage is that it can just learn from historical data 
and that we don't really need to make models, and which would make it very expensive. For that, we can just use model predictive control. And then on the model, uh, model free reinforcement learning controllers, we have two types, uh, off policy and on policy. Uh, off policy methods, they will, they will decide a policy or a function that will map the states with the actions, and then it will start taking actions for, a, for like many time steps. It will receive many rewards, and it will see how good or bad that policy was, and then it will make, update that policy after many time steps. And then on policy methods, so this is on policy methods, and then of policy methods, we don't really need to follow that policy, that policy all along. In of policy methods, we can actually take historical data and then find the values of all the actions and all the states, just iterating through that historical data that we had, and we can just find the optimal policy or update these policies without really needing to take all the actions. In the policy methods, we don't really know what policy was followed uh, to obtain that historical data, and therefore we cannot make a, uh, take advantage of that data. In of policy methods, we don't care what was the policy that was used to make all this data, so we can still use it. So these are the most popular algorithms and the most basic ones for each of them. For of policy methods is uh, Q-learning, which is yeah, one of the most popular ones, and then on policy we will have a uh, SARSA. Yeah, so this is the main equation of, of Q-learning, which is also probably the most important one. So before I introduce the, the value V, which is the value of a given policy given a given state. So here the Q value is the value of taking a specific action when you are in a certain state. So the Q value of a given state and an action will tell you what the cumulative sum of the discounted rewards will be if under this state you take this action and then after that you follow the optimal policy. Therefore, uh, by finding the Q values of all the states and actions, we can just look at what the, what's the path of the maximum Q values and just follow that path all along in order to, to follow the optimal policy. So in order to see yeah, like a real-world implementation of Q-learning in an actual building, you can follow this reference. And then, yeah, now I will show like a, a short example of model-based reinforcement learning and see how, how these methods are, how powerful they are, and how they can also learn from, from interaction with the environment. In this case, it's a model-based model agent, but I'm just showing it anyway for uh, demonstration purposes. So this is uh, the Stanford helicopter. So here, they just, they just had a pilot, like piloting helicopter. They collected the data, made a model, and then they use the train reinforcement learning with this model, and then they implemented it into the actual helicopter. And it was able to perform all these maneuvers, just like the, just like the pilot would do. And then also take some exploratory movements and make some improvements in, in the policy. And then, and then for another example of the implementation of Q-learning for an actual building, is this paper that you can take a look at, but it's basically trying to learn through interaction with this building that has some photovoltaic array and, and thermal collectors, and then a borehole that can store thermal energy in the basement, and then the objective is to maximize the, the energy savings in the building. Yeah, so the main question is how we can learn uh, from this environment. So we have what we call exploration and exploitation phase. So the in the exploration phase, the agent or the controller will start taking exploratory movements that might not be optimal, just in order to collect more information and try to learn from the environment. So first we initialize the controller, it will start taking exploratory movements and then and collecting batches of information of states, actions and rewards, and it will make updates on the, on the key value function that I showed earlier. Then it will start making these updates over time, and then once the policy is, starts to get better, instead of taking so many exploratory movements, we will perform more explo ex exploitation movements, which are taking actions that the reinforcement learning agent thinks are the best. And then taking, so it will take maybe like 90 or 99% of the time, 
the, ac the actions that is considering to be the best, and then still like a small percentage of the time will take some random actions. Um, just for, I'm curious, so if we use one year for learning and then in the next year they're going to add more or new appliances or, uh, you know, a new kid or something, yeah. uh, then what? I mean, what, what happens to the performance of the model? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, this was particular, particularly for this example. Uh, but yeah, answering your question is that you still need to be able to to, to explore, to take more. Relearn and, again. And relearn, exactly. Mm. So it's learning constantly. So even if you are still exploiting and not taking mm. exploratory movements, if you change anything in the system, then your rewards are going to change. Mm. And it will learn from these new rewards, and mm. it will update these key values. And you can Apology. learn based on the, because people usually, uh, you consume energy differently in different hours. Mm -hmm. And so is it based on t like for different type of day and time of the day you, yeah. you have different model so, and then? Well, it's not a different model. You can mm. actually just include the, hour, the time of the day as a state, ah, okay. the day of the week as another state. Mm. So anything you, you think it will have an impact on the reward or the probability of getting one reward or another, you just add it as a state okay. into your system. Does it change the rewards retrospectively or just until it gets more information to then change it again? So the, no, the, so the rewards are obtained immediately. Yeah, OK. It, oh, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah, uh, no. So yeah. You mean if it has to readapt? Yeah. Yeah, so no. So you need to forget, uh, in that case, the past. Oh, OK. To some extent. So maybe you can record only the last year or a few months. And then everything that is before that, you forget it. And then it will just record the new rewards. And it will continue making the updates, right? Let's say that your system is behaving some way for one year, and then all of, us, all of a sudden it changes operation, or the model of the building changes. Then you will continue taking decisions uh, with your previous knowledge, but in the new modified uh, system. And then the rewards that it will obtain will be different. They might have different probabilities, or it might be different because the building changed. So this, will, this new data is collected but maybe you are only keeping one year of information. So after one year, you will only have data that is updated, and you will have forgotten the previous data. Is that like a step change, or does that how, somehow interact with the discount factor? No, this would be more called the replay buffer. Okay. So you have a buffer of observations that you are storing. So if you, if you make it smaller, that means you will forget more information that you will only record the previous 1,000 time steps, yeah.